continue on in Genesis. We are in Genesis, and tonight we will be in Genesis chapter 18. Now, if you recall, in chapter 17, last week the Lord reiterated His promise to him and says, listen, my, my plan hasn't changed. You kind of had a diversion here with Ishmael, but my plan is still the same. I'm going to give you a child through Sarah, and the two of you are going to bring forth my promised one. What a great reminder we had last week that so often we try to help God out and we really muck things up, but the good thing to know is that God will always come back and get us on track. Amen? Amen. I think we all need to hear that tonight because I think sometimes we are really good at beating ourselves up and delaying the move of God in our lives. And all God really needs for us to do is confess and say, I need to get back on track. And so that's what we see in chapter 17. He fell on his face. He worshiped. And God said, I am going to make that womb inside your wife, inside of you. That is going to be a, where I'm going to bring forth my child. And so he reinstates the miracle to him and he worships. And they follow in an act of obedience, if you recall, in circumcision. And he led by example. And that's where we led our F, lend, ended off Excuse me, last week is that we would see him lead by example now chapter 18 begins with what word okay then or now we once again now have a transition going on so if you would just put in the space there between the two uh chapter 17 ends in obedience it ends in obedience they said god said be uh, be circumcised and so they did it then what happens when god's kids are obedient what's it say now 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 what now the Lord appears. See, so often people are telling me, how come God doesn't talk to people anymore like He did in the Bible? And I'm saying, He does. How come people aren't living in obedient like people in the Bible? Or living in the, that are response in their sin like in the Bible? Because we see, Abraham is a man who's made a lot of mistakes. And yet we see God calling him a great man of faith, so on and so forth. And so his faith was not in his consistency, but in God's. And so here the Lord appears to him. And that's what it says here in chapter 18, verse 1. Now the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of memory while he was sitting at the tent door in the heat of the day. Now we're going to stop right here and we're going to take a lot of notes, believe it or not. Yes, in just verse 1. Okay. First of all, it says the Lord appeared to him. Now, believe it or not, if you can jot down somewhere, this is the sixth time we have this phrase. The sixth time now Abraham has the Lord appear to him, but something different about this appearance. There's something different about this. And what is that? Well, what does it mean it says where the Lord appeared to him? Well, look at chapter 17, verse 1. What's it say in chapter 17, verse 1? It says, now, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord, what's it say? The Lord appeared to Abram and said to him. But what does that mean in that, that he appeared to him? Well, let's go to chapter 15, verse 1. And look at one of those other times when we see the Lord coming. And he says, And after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a what? In a vision. So this sixth time that he is coming to him is very different because in the other times he was coming in a word, in a vision. He was either in a dream and the Lord would come and he would speak to him. As I say to you, the Lord has spoken to me. And many times I'll say, when this happened and I heard the Lord say to me, I did not have a physical presence of a being standing in front of me, but I knew I was hearing from God. Anyone know what I'm talking about? Okay, so that's what he's talking about here on these other occurrences with him, except for one other one, which we are going to look at here tonight. And so the Lord comes to him in a very physical way. And so we want to pay attention to that. Now, why? Why is it so important that he comes? Well, we're going to learn that as we study, but I'm going to let the cat out of the bag so that you can join with me as we go on. Why is it so different that he comes in a physical form to meet with Abraham tonight? The answer is this, because when the time was ready for the Lord to fulfill His promise, He came in person. When the time was ready for God to fulfill His promise, He came in person. The work of God is a very personal thing. He has a personal plan for each one of you. He says, I have plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you hope and a future. Do you believe that? So the point of the matter is, is that when God has a move and a work and a word for you, when He has a word for you, God is the one who will come and He will speak to you. And it's here we see Him setting this precedent saying, listen, I have something for you and I'm going to come to you. But there's even another reason why. Because here He is starting off this entire move of God's people, this whole multitude, this Abraham, father of the multitudes. And He needs this super encouragement. He needs this super presence. Why? Well, we'll look at it as we go on. So the first thing it says the Lord appeared to him, he comes to him physically. Why? Because it's time for fulfillment. It's time to God say, I need you to know, look, smell, understand who I am. Then the second thing it says in verse 1, it says this, the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of memory while he was sitting at the tent of the door. And what does it say in that last part? 
What do you think of when you hear in the heat of the day? Now, all of you going with me to Israel in August are going to know what in the heat of the day means. They mean somewhere between 6 a.m. and 10 p.m. No, okay. In the heat of the day. Here we, when we hear the phrase, in the heat of the day, in the heat of the moment, in the heat, that is usually when we're at our worst. That is when we are weakest. That is when there is trials and burdens that are coming upon our life. I, th- I, I don't think the Lord is just being poetic when it's saying here, here in the heat of the day, it's in midday He's coming to Him. But I think there's also an insinuation here that, hey, all of these promises, the troubles that you've been having here with your son, all these other different things with the two wives, blah, blah, blah. In the heat of the day, the Lord appears. Why do I want to be comforted in that tonight? Because it doesn't matter what you're going through. There's never a time that God can't come to you. And I find that so often in my life, it's in the heat of the day, it's in the valley when the Lord does show up. When He shows up in the most brightest ways. In fact, sometimes the darker the pit, the brighter you can see the Lord. Now, I'm not suggesting you go to a pit just so you can see it. But I am suggesting that sometimes the Lord does bring those circumstances in our lives so that we can get no place but to look up. I love what Corey Ten Broom's sister said to her. She says, she said, Corey... There is no pit so deep that God is not deeper still. And I love that. And I don't know where it is right now in your life and what time of the day, whether it's the cool of the night or whether it's the heat of the day, the Lord has a word for you and the Lord wants to speak to you. And so the Lord comes to him in person because we have a personal God and he says this, And when he had lifted up his eyes, he looked and behold, how many men? Interesting. Three men were standing opposite him and when he saw them, he ran from the tent of the door to meet them and bowed down to the earth or bowed himself down to the earth. Now, a couple insights here. He sees these men and there's three of them, which is interesting. We'll talk about that in a moment. But he sees these three and there's this compulsory in him that as soon as he sees these three, he recognizes something distinct, something different about them. And so what does he do? He runs. How old is he? 99. 99, church. What I like is, again, the same thing I used to hear from my dad almost every single week. Don't tell me what you can't do. Show me what you can do. Run to the Lord. I don't know how old you are in the faith. I don't know how old your walk has been. I don't know how old things have been getting in your life. When you hear and see the Lord, run to Him. Run. Don't wait. Don't. When we see the Father Himself describing Himself when He saw the prodigal, it's the only time in the Bible you see God in a hurry where he picks up his robe and he runs that he might go and and grab a hold of his prodigal and love on him. God is in a hurry to restore. Are we in a hurry to get to him to be restored? You see, Abraham here, knowing that he had done some things that were major, now the Lord says, do this act of obedience. He does. Now the Lord says, great. You were in that spout. Look at me for a second. You were right under that spout where my word, will, and way comes out. My blessing comes out. Now I can speak to you. Now we have one another's attention. And so when he sees the Lord, he recognizes the Lord, and he runs to him. Dear one, I don't know who you are, but you've been saying, how come God hasn't been speaking? I am here to tell you tonight that He has been. The Bible tells me very clearly that He is speaking. Psalm 19 tells me that He has been speaking. The question is, have you been still enough? Are you living right now in a moment of obedience that you can recognize the very words of God? He spoke to you today. Did you recognize the presence, the love letter that He said to you? Somewhere, somehow, in something, God was speaking. Did you recognize it? Did you take time to be still and know that He was God? To get yourself into His realm, into His zone, if I can say such a word, that you would recognize the things of God because you're recognizing His hand here and His no yes and His move there and whatever it was. And God showed you something and you would just be at peace with it. You see, Abram, now in obedience, finds himself being able to recognize Him and he knows that this is God. Why? How do I know that? Because he says he ran from the door of the tent of meeting. And what did he do when he got there? Underline that. He bowed himself down to the earth. Folks, we know from Revelation quite clearly that no angel is to receive worship. This is not just a divine being. This is not just an angel. This is the Lord because he worships him in an act of worship. And this angel receives it, number one. Number two, the words that come out of his mouth in verse three, after he falls down and worships him, then he says, my Lord, If I have found favor in your sight, please do not pass your servant by. Now, it says, how many men came? Three. Three. I don't know. Let me have your attention, please. I don't know. This is 100% conjecture. But when we go back to chapter 14, we understand that in that context, when Abraham, Abraham, he was at that time Abram, 
Saul, Lot got taken captive. He takes 300 of his own men and he goes off the battle to get back Lot. And when he goes back and gets Lot, he takes him from where? He was in Sodom. And so the kingdom of Sodom had been conquered by these five kings and they had taken everyone away as plunder. And so he goes forth and does a battle and brings back Lot and his family and all the people of Sodom. And as he's bringing them back, a certain wonderful person met him. That person was whom, remember? Melchizedek. How did he know when he's sitting here that far away that these people were special? Can I propose that maybe one of those three was Mel? We're very personal. We're in close terms. <laughs> Could it be? Why three? Hmm. God the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit coming together, the deity walking in there in persons personified coming. I don't know, but it makes you go, hmm. Because he recognized something about them and he comes and bows down and then his first words are, My Lord, my Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, please do not pass your servant by. Now, can you just underline that tonight? I would like you to do something and that is, as Christian, I'd like you to read that and just meditate on it. Just take a moment, I'll shut up, just read it. There are many of these in this chapter tonight that I want you to look at. And this first one here, my Lord, if I found favor in your sight, please do not pass your servant by. Sounds to me like a good prayer, amen? Do you, Christian, do you really hunger for more of God or just more from God? You know, does our prayer life completely consist of list or we say, Lord, can we just sit? Can we just chill? Can I just be still and hang with you, Lord? If I if I'm a favor in your sight, meaning at this moment, Lord Jesus, there's nothing I need to come and ask to repent. I'm not in walking rebellion right now. Lord Jesus, today I've sought to live my life. Of course, when you see Jesus, what's the first thing you're going to do? Repent. Because when you see perfection, you're painfully aware of your own imperfection. So you see the Lord and you say, oh, Lord, forgive me. But then, Lord, if I am in, in that sweet corner with you, Lord God, you have died on that cross for me. If we are family, Lord... Don't, don't just blow by. Don't just give me this Wednesday night nugget and this Sunday morning nugget. Lord, if I have found favor, if I am your child, please don't pass by. Can we hang? I remember the first time that my wife and I went to this place called Medieval Times. Anyone aware of that place? Okay, it's where they dress up like knights and the whole thing and you walk in there and we sit down and we're sitting there in Medieval Times and the gal comes up and they're all dressed in the period outfits and she has the big picture and she goes, would you like anything to drink, my Lord? And I looked at my wife and I said, now how come you don't talk to me like that? <laughs> you know, and I think I got cracked, you know. Um, then we began to discuss sitting there after they went through that whole context of the word, my Lord. There, even in that context, it was one of position, of one of a servant, a master and servant. And do we recognize that when we say Lord, that that's not his name, it's his title? Master and servant, the privilege to be with him. Oh Lord, he sees him, he bows down, he's prostrate. And you see, I want us to somehow be Christians who will walk in the balance, that recognize that God is to be feared, he is to be worshipped, he is worthy of our praise, and yet he still says, call me Papa God. He says, come, sit in my lap and pluck my beard and let me just put my arms around you. That's the image that he, when he describes himself, he always uses the term father. He uses one who's looking and searching and seeking and willing to give his forgiveness. That's how he describes himself when Jesus gives the parables. Am I making any sense? We, we, we have to walk in this beautiful balance because I think we can come to one extreme or the other where, hey, you know, it's the big G, what's up? What's up, JD, what's up? And we get into these kinds of things. Do we recognize that God is holy and righteous and should not have to participate in the sin in my life? And I do not want to ever see Bill Tipton to have come and get me out of jail. I did not ever want to look in the eyes of my physical dad and break his heart that way because I knew he loved me so much. So when my hooligan friends did things that were that hooliganish, that the consequences could have been jail, I never went there because I didn't want to have to see Bill Tipton's eyes. Do we have that kind of intimacy with the Lord that I don't want to see His eyes and say, yeah, Lord, I did it again. 
Yeah, Lord, I, I went to that website. Yeah, Lord, I, I said that stuff again about people and I know I'm not supposed to be gossiping and slandering. Lord, are we at that point where we recognize as we saw on Sunday that our sin does what to the Holy Spirit? Grieves His Holy Spirit. You see, this is where Abram says, please, my Lord, can we hang? And then the next thing he says, verse 4, please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Now, what do you think of, church, as soon as you hear this passage? Washing the feet. What, what? Jesus. Here's Jesus getting his feet washed and a couple thousand years later, he's coming back and he's washing the feet. You see, why? In this story... Abram, Abraham knows his position. He is the servant. What is the thing that the servant does? The servant washes the feet. Now, who is Abraham? Remember, he's the big daddy. He's the big cheese. He's the big head honcho. He's the one that owns all of this. There are so many cattle and workers and laborers that he couldn't even live in the same area with Lot. And God blessed him. He is the richest man, quote unquote, in town. And yet when he sees God, he sees his priorities. Amen. So he's the one that is saying, I'm going to serve and wash the Lord's feet. That is why when Jesus came in, all the disciples were sitting there going, well, who's the servant? Who's going to do this? They were all putting themselves in a position, and that's when the Lord said, hey, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. So here we see Abraham getting it. Here we see the Lord in the New Testament showing it to us. This is how you love on somebody, folks. Not in word, but in deed. Amen? Amen. Let's love on one another, not just in word, but in deed. He says, please, let me get your well-being. Let me wash your feet that you might find rest. And he says, and I will bring a piece of bread that you may refresh yourself. After that, you may go on since you have visited your servant. And they said to him, and what does it say? So do as you have said. Anyone's version say it a little differently? Pretty much says that, doesn't it? Would you underline or highlight that? And take a moment and meditate on that phrase. They have just made promises of what they want to bring before God. And what does God say to them? I wonder if we've... You who've been whose testimonies, I should say, are similar to mine, where you, you grew up in the church and you found yourself at summer camp when they sent you out for quiet time. And you found yourself sitting under a tree at a certain spot and you open up your Bible and the Lord really began to speak to you how much He loved you. And you really resonated and you said, Lord, I just... I want to be like you. And Lord, I, I want to be able to be more bold at school. And Father, I want to be able to love my brother. I want to be able to da 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 Can we, have we ever heard the Lord say, so do as you have said? I don't want to stir up a wrong kind of guilt tonight, but I want to stir up a right kind of guilt. That what kind of promises have we made as adults in the present? What kind of things have we said? And can we hear tonight that the first words the Lord says when Abraham says, I want to do this for you, the Lord says, great. The Lord didn't tell him to. The Lord didn't ask him to. He, out of his own heart of worship, he said, Lord, these are the things that I want to do for you. And the only thing the Lord says is, do it. Keep your word. And where we have failed, where we have fallen on that, I think tonight all we need to do is say, Papa God, would you forgive me on that? And would you refresh in me whether that, that was something that was of you or whether or not that was from me? And Lord, for that, help me to watch my tongue. Because church, I got to tell you something. 26 years now as a pastor, I've seen a whole lot of this. And again, you guys come on Wednesday nights. You're the core. You're here to say, God, give it to me straight up. One, two, three punches. Amen? Amen. But why do we have so many Bible studies and we do sign-ups and we fill them up 27, 30 and we turn people away and then the first week there's 27 or 30 and then the second week there's 20 and then the third week then there's about 14 and then in the next week then there's about 9 and when my wife is having the last party or when whatever person's Bible study is having the last party and I come upstairs and there's 7 in there. Whatever happened to letting our yes be yes and our no be no? Or people will say, yeah, we'll be there to set up. Yeah, we'll be there to be a part of this. We will do this thing. Yes, sounds great. Well, what you have said, go and do. 
See, your commitment isn't to the church. It's not to me. If you said to the Lord, yes, Lord, I will do whatever you want me to do. Well, he says, okay, great. Tithe, he says, okay, great. Keep your pants on. He says, okay, great. Here's a few things. And then when we respond and say, yes, Lord, that is what I will do. I'm asking us to be a generation that says, I'm going to watch what I say and I'm going to mean what I say and I'm going to do what I say. Amen. Amen. And that's going to be a different generation. And listen, it's not wax. I mean, I could have Pastor Wayne here, Pastor Ralph, Pastor Bill. They'd all stand right here or they'd be sitting in the front row going, Amen. Amen. Preach it, brother. Across the board, churches find themselves with that same statistic, 10% doing 90% of the work. In other words, ask yourself, as you've come tonight and as you've come during this season and been here, how much of prep, set up, tear down, clean up have you been a part of? I'm not, like I said, throwing out a wrong kind of guilt. I'm saying if we are 200, 300 people who have come to say, we want to be like Jesus, now that we're moving into a park and we're going to have to get chairs off of a truck and put them down and having to get lights that are going to be strung up and strung back and so on and so forth, are we going to be the kind of people that go, yo, that sounds great, woo church in the park. Okay. Well, now the world's going to be watching. And are they going to see... Matt and Johnny and Walter carrying their stuff back to the car again. The same guys they saw earlier. Because, you know, we're going to have the Micronesians sitting in the corner in the bush and they're going to be watching us for three or four weeks before they ever come on over. As you've said, this is, do it. Pretty simple. Verse 6. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, Quickly, prepare these three measures of fine flour and knead it and make bread cakes. And Abraham ran also to the herd and took a tender choice calf and he gave it to the servant and he hurried to prepare it. And he took curds of milk with the calf that he had prepared and he placed it before them and he was standing by them under the tree as they ate. Now, we in our culture will eat with anybody, especially if it's free. Amen? Amen. You know, I I stopped by, you know, mom's place today, you know, a.k.a. Jack's, um, and didn't know the other people around. But nonetheless, I can go in and eat. That is not the context here. In this day and age, in this period of time, to share a meal with someone was a sign of intimate fellowship. Jot that down. It was a sign of intimate fellowship. You see, what he is doing, and that is why he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone opens the door, I will come in with him and sup with him. That is what God is saying in Revelation. He's saying, listen, church, listen, bride, if you open the door, we're not just going to be in the same community. I want to be in your house. I want to be at your table. I want to eat with you. I want to be a part of what you're eating. I want to take what you're taking. I want to consume what you are consuming. Let's be one in spirit. And so here we see a very personal God personally coming. And Abraham saying, I want to take this intimacy and share all that I have. Tonight when we are worshiping, it's not sing song at the end of service. It's time for you to say, Lord, let's share a meal. And that meal tonight might not be in physical bread, but that meal was going to be in spiritual bread. The Word of God here tonight as you hear it, and then you bring out, you lay down the things in your life and say, Lord, I want to give each of these things back unto you. And so here he ran. I love that verse 7 underlined. It says, and he ran to the herd. He quickly wanted to bring his love affair back to the Lord, sharing that intimate uh, relationship. God was there. God was wanting to be with him, and God did that. I think it's interesting in verse 8. Get your pencils out. It says, he took the curds of milk and the calf with which he had prepared and placed it before them. And what was he doing? And Abram was standing where? Under a tree or by a tree as they ate. That makes me think of, oh, a particular place called Golgotha. Where certain other people stood by a tree. And the bread of life was being offered to them. The question is tonight, will you eat from that? You see, that tree, Golgotha, the cross as it's called, where Jesus was saying, listen, the price of sin, the reason for that fellowship, the ability of that fellowship, that I can come in and partner with Waxer, an inconsistent man, and yet I can have why, because that tree that he paid the price for us. Just an interesting insight that came to my mind when I saw the word tree. Verse 9, Then they said to him, Where is Sarah your wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I will surely return to you at this time next year, and Sarah your wife shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door, which was behind him. <clears throat> and Abraham and Sarah were old and advanced in age. And Sarah was, what's it say? Past childbearing. Now, here's something that's really interesting. 
Then he goes on, and Sarah, what did she say when she heard this? She laughed. Now underline that for a second, church. She laughed. She laughed to herself saying, After I have become old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, also being old? And the Lord said to Abram, or Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I indeed bear a child when I am, low, am, I am old? Excuse me. Is anything too difficult for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you at this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. Now, we've got some great nuggets in here to take a look at here. First of all, the Lord comes in, and then one of the first times, like we saw last week, we now see Him affirming that He's finally giving a date. God is going to give us details when we need them. I've learned that my walk with the Lord is on a need-to-know basis. Anyone else know what, know what that's like? I think if the Lord told me my whole life, it would have popped. My head would have popped. It would have exploded. You're going to do this, you're going to go here, you're going to do this, and then you're going to be doing this. I'm like, ah! I find in my Christian walk that the Lord says, you see that hallway? Go down it. And if you know right now where I'm looking down there, only because I've been here before do I know that when I get down there, there's going to be a doorway to the left and a doorway to the right. But standing right here, I don't know that. And you see, folks, if you haven't taken that first step in obedience and stride where God says, hey, walk this way. He says, walk this way. And then when you get down there, you, oh my gosh, there's an entire doorway. Wow, there's an entire city. There's an entire community. Now you go down that way and all of a sudden he says, turn left. And oh, wow, there's another light down here. And we get to walk on this need to know basis. And so God says, you're going to have a son. But now the time to know is here. And he says, I'm going to come back next time this year and you're going to have a baby. You're going to have a wah going on. And what does Sarah do? She laughs. But we have to make a distinction between this laugh and Abraham's laugh. Because last week, when he said that you're going to have a child, Abraham did what? He laughed. But does God not commend him for it? Yes. But here we see Sarah, in a sense, getting a scolding, getting a questioning. And she laughed. Why? Because there's two different laughs here. The laugh that we saw in Abraham was a laugh of how incredible. Tonight's laugh was a laugh of how impossible. How are you laughing at God? Are we at a point tonight when we are looking at our lives and our finances and our world and our situation and you're thinking, oh, end time scenarios and all this different stuff and oh, I'm so worried about this and that and so it looks gloom and doom. I don't know, folks. Listen, no matter what goes in the world, it's not going to be gloom and doom because even if it gets gloom, it's going to go gloom and zoom. Because I know that God's going to call me out. I understand that. I've read the scripture. I read the text. I looked at the end. We win. I can read the book. He gave it to me so that I can have the comfort of knowing His guiding protection upon our lives. And so we understand here that this was a laugh, a laugh of not. I'm going to give you this. <laughs> not. She came up with every reason why it couldn't be possible. If this is 24 years after, it shouldn't have been possible 24 years ago. It says, Sarah, verse 12, laughed to herself and said, After I have become so old... That will I have pleasure and my Lord being old also? And the Lord says to her this wonderful question. Why did Sarah laugh? I wonder how the Lord is going to be questioning us. How he's going to be saying about our heart's desires. When we hear God and people saying things about him and the power of prayer. The things in believing that God works in miracles. Amen. Let me give you an example of what I mean. Someone comes up to you. One of, one of the commentators I read this week had that, this illustration I'm giving to you. And it was just so rich. And I, and I want to share it with you. He said, don't you note that we sit here and we sometimes get a little heavy on Sarah. And yet he says, when someone comes up to you and says, hey, I have a headache, would you pray with me? Deanna doesn't think it, no problem. Just, hey, let's pray. Lord, be with this headache and just take it away and just give them total comfort and guidance. And everyone's like, okay, great, wonderful. Then someone comes up to you and says, hey, I just came from the doctor and the neurosurgeons say that I have a, term, a tumor and brain cancer and they're giving me about a week to live. It's inoperable. It's completely throughout all the brain. And if they should do any surgery, they would probably cut immediately optic nerves and so on and so forth. And they've just given me a week to live. We hear that and we go, hey guys, can you come around here? Can we pray? Can we get four, five, six people? Can we get around in circles and pray? And can we do that? All of a sudden we go into different mode. Why do we go into different mode from headache to tumor? It's the same God. Amen? Amen? It's not name it and claim it. It's request and rest. And God is God. And you are a child of God. And you can pray. You don't have to go, whoa, that's heavy. Let's go sing the pastor. Why do you really think my prayer is going to be more powerful? 
I'm a sinner saved by grace. My pants go on one leg and the other. Now, I understand the conduit of faith. I understand, hey, let's bring it. I understand the scriptures say, let's cast out and let's pray. I understand prayer chain, prayer chain, getting the word out. My point is, why do one we have fear and the other we don't? Does that make sense? Are you following me? You see, here she's seeing every reason of its immensity that I am so... Now, why did God wait these 25 years? We peaked last week and we got the answer. Why? The Bible says so very clearly. God waited so that they couldn't. That way you'd be sure that He could. Amen? God waited to make sure that she couldn't, that they couldn't, so that everyone would know that He could. The glory goes to God. Now that is why we need to look at something here tonight because the question on the table that God has proposed is anything impossible for God. Listen, I don't know who you are and I don't know what your stories are, but let's have the first one up if we can. Here tonight we have the context of a woman who is now 99. She is way past quote-unquote childbearing day, uh, years and age and availability. And here's God saying, you're going to have a baby. And the, first, the thing that happens is she starts to laugh as we see in our text. And she begins to laugh and says, is this even possible? I am so old. There's no way that I can do that. And the Lord's response, I love, is this. Verse 14, is anything too difficult for the Lord? I want you to underline that because that's the Lord's response. Not a preacher. It is God saying, is anything too impossible for me? That's what he says. Then as we move on down to Jeremiah. In Jeremiah, we see the nation of Israel being told that they are going to be punished. They are going to be dispersed. They're going to be kicked out of the country. And yet Jeremiah is also proclaiming, not only are you going to be taken away into captivity, but God is going to bring you back. And God is going to bless you. And these very fields that are just completely wiped, and they're, they're, these things that you see that are green now, they're, they're going to be a, a, a dry desert. There's not going to be a tree left standing here. But you know what God's going to do? God's going to bring it back. And this is what happens, if you notice now, in Jeremiah 32, verse 17. Jeremiah 32 says, And the Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heavens and the earth with thy great powers and thy outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for thee. And let's go down to the next verse in Jeremiah. Then he says in verse 27, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too difficult for me? So here we got God in Genesis saying, There's nothing too hard for me to do. Here we got God saying, you know what? There's a nation that's going to get taken out, but I'm going to preserve these people, and these people are going to remain in their ethnicity, their identity, their language, and their culture, and I'm going to bring them back, and it's going to flourish, and they're going to be part of the end-time scenario. Anyone here know a Jew? Raise your hand. Okay, anyone here in this room know a Hittite? Partied with any Amalekites lately? No? Nobody here? Philistine cousin? But we know a Jew. Is anything too impossible for God? No. All right. Then let's go on to another one here. God says in Matthew 19, there's a situation here in Matthew 19, verse 26. He has a rich man who comes up to him and he says, hey, you need to sell everything and go. And the man says, you know what? I, I, I can't do that. I, my, my things are too important. And then the Lord says, you know what? It's so hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it would be easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And when the disciples heard this, they were very astonished and said, Then who can be saved? And looking upon them, Jesus said to them, With men, this is impossible. But with God, what? Okay. Who's speaking? Jesus. And Jesus is whom? God. This is the third time I hear God saying, Yeah, with well, you guys, for you to get saved, you can't get you saved, but I can get you saved anytime I want to get you saved because I'm God and nothing's... And nothing's, nothing is impossible with God. Are you getting the theme where I'm going here with this? I can see why you're not reading so clear. You've got records in the way. Okay, now. <laughs> sorry about that. Moving on. One more very precious one that I wanted you to see because I want you to get this theme throughout the Bible. There's this young gal. She's outside cleaning clothes uh, as a young, probably 13, 14-year-old gal would be doing. And as uh, she's out there being obedient, doing her chores, the angel of the Lord comes upon her and the angel says, Hey, guess what? You're going to have a baby. And this baby is going to be the child of God. She goes, excuse me? How can this be? I've never been with the man. And this is what God says here in Luke chapter 1, verse 37. He says this, For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, be it done to me according to your word. You see, folks, what I wanted us to see here tonight is that we thought maybe it would be too impossible for a guy like Saul 
who was going out killing and persecuting the church and putting people in jail, Saul to become Paul? How did that ever happen? Or how about this guy named Peter? And he's arrested in prison and the church is praying for his release, but not really believing him, but praying because that's what we're supposed to do. Meanwhile, he's released and he's knocking at the door, but we don't believe it because we're praying for him. Is anyone tracking with me here? I hope we're all getting a little bit of a tish, tish, tish. As God is saying, folks, what is holding us back from doing great and awesome mighty things in our lives, great and awesome intimacy with God, great and awesome things within our communities and our world? What's holding us back? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Us. I want you to say something with me tonight. Nothing is impossible with God. Say it with me. Go. Nothing is impossible with God. Okay. Say it one more time. Go. Nothing Nothing is impossible with God. God. What's that first word you said? Nothing. Nothing. Nothing is impossible with God. You got cancer. That's not beyond God. You got kid problems. That's not beyond God. You got marriage issues. That's not beyond God. Nothing is impossible with God. And so when you understand that nothing is impossible with God, then fear, false evidence appearing real, needs to go outside. It needs to go outside. And you see... I've said to you so many times that I wish I could say things, but then people get hurt and they, they, they take a personal offense and they feel like I'm attacking them and I'm not. But I must, you must allow me to be able to say at times I can get very sick and tired, very frustrated with the people of God who will say, oh, I believe in the Lord, and yet the counseling load that we have shows that they are not believing in their God. They're believing in the problems. And if you could tonight understand that great and awesome and mighty is your God and nothing is impossible with God, To buy a station and pay for it, nothing is impossible with God. To get this cockle thing, nothing is impossible with God. Which, by the way, just to let you know, because you're family and you're in this pilgrimage with me, I got a phone call today from the state. State was all happy, working with us and getting everything together. I had a great meeting yesterday. Everything is rolling. I get a phone call. Oh, by the way, we just got to let you know, we got a phone call today and uh, Hawaii Five-0, CBS really wants the warehouse. Hold on. What's impossible? Nothing. Nothing is impossible with whom? God. So I just kind of laughed. I said, well, maybe they'll just get in there, fix the whole thing up, spend all the money, make it nice. It'll run two weeks, it'll flop, and then I get it. <laughs> Let Hollywood do the work. They got the budget. I don't. <laughs> Nothing is impossible with God. And they haven't even signed the paperwork. They might try to look at things and da 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 All I'm saying is if my daddy wants me there, nothing is going to stop me from being there. And he wants you in communion with him. And so the only thing that's going to stop you from being in communion with him is going to be you tonight. Because God is a gentleman. And God will not force himself upon you. See, Satan, he's sly. He will come in the back door, sneaky ways. But God comes and knocks on the front door. He says, I, ha- I stand at the door and knock. I stand at the door knock. I don't kick it open. And tonight, are you going to be a person, a Christian that says, you know what, I'm going to believe. I am not going to be a Sarah. I'm going to be an Abraham. When God says things that sound so ridiculous, like you can heal my marriage, the child that I haven't talked to in 17 years because we've been estranged, you can fix that? Yeah. And just go, ha, ha, ha. God, you're awesome. I love you, Lord. You're just going to, oh, I can't wait to see how you're going to do that. Or are you going to go, well, you know, his dad's still, you know, and then, and then they wouldn't want to do that. You know, they moved to Alabama. I, I don't think they won't even answer my phone calls. Okay, Sarah. It's one or the other tonight, church. Amen? The line is in the sand. Let's read it. Let's see it. Let's believe it. Let's worship. Let's go get cakes and give them to God. That's what he did. He ran and said, I want to wash your feet and I want to bring what I got. Then we look down here, verse 14. God says, is anything too impossible for the Lord? At this appointed time, He says, I will return to you. And at this time next year, baby, you are going to hear a baby. He will be crying. And you're going to be in there. What happens next is amazing. He says, why did Sarah laugh? Verse 13. Look at Sarah's response. Verse 15. Sarah, what's it say? Denied it, however, saying, I did not laugh. For she was afraid. And he said, no, but you did laugh. Folks, I want you to jot something very important. And that is this. Unbelief makes us not only cowards, it makes us liars. Unbelief makes us not only cowards, it makes us liars. Because we lie to ourselves on why it's okay. We rationalize and rationalize is just rational. Okay, rational lies. You see, she starts saying, no, it wasn't me. I didn't do that. And so we find ourselves, God says, hey, remember when you said, no, I didn't say that. Uh, yeah, you did. 
I got it right here. Remember that skit we had? The little letter that he wrote? Where'd you get that? Um, hello, I'm God. He knows every hair on our head. He knows what we've said. She says, I didn't laugh. He goes, um, you did. Straight up. Let me check. Yep, you did. God knows us. And this is the best part. He knows every little thing about us and is hopelessly, emphatically, unashamedly, unapologetically in love with us. Isn't that amazing? That's amazing. That the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Now Sarah denied it. Now verse 16, these angels now, these three, the angel of the Lord, and we know the Lord is there for sure, and whether the other two are just angels or whether it's the Trinity, I don't know. But it says, Then the men rose up from there and looked down towards Sodom. And Abraham was walking with them and to send them off. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? He's, he's walking with him. He goes, I think I need to share something with you, Abraham. I'm going to bring you in. He said, God says, I'm going to fill you in. The Lord says, I call you friend. And I, I do not hide things from you, but I will reveal to you. I am your friend, is what it says in John 15. And here I see this same communion as he's walking with him. The Lord says, shall I hide from him? He says, no, 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 no. I want to share with you something that's going on. There is something that's about to happen. There's going to be a cause and effect of sin. And I want you to know about it. So he goes on to say to him, verse 18, Since Abraham will surely become a great and mighty nation, and in him all the nations of the earth will be blessed. For I have chosen him in order that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteous and justice in order that, second time now notice in this one verse, in order that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. What is God saying here? He's saying, Abraham... I'm going to make a nation out of you. And in that nation that's going to come out of you, what I want you tonight to see is there's going to be consequences of sin. Why? Because I want you to raise your children to understand the fear of the Lord. That there is judgment and judgment is going to come and it's going to come upon Sodom. Why? Because of their wickedness. And for that reason, I want you to raise your children to understand that there is cause and effects with God. Folks, I want to make sure that all of us are raising our children, whether we're discipling people or whether you're physically a parent here tonight, have we shared with them a holy God that we could teach them to fear the Lord that there are consequences to sin. And that's what he says here. I'm going to share this with you. Not that you can be freaked out. I'm going to share this with you so that you will understand because you're going to be a great and mighty nation and your people need to know to live righteously before me and understand that there are consequences to sin. So now he goes on to say this in verse 20. And the Lord said, The outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great and their sin is exceedingly grave. Now what is the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah? What do we, what do we recall about that? Yes, you, you, go to Ezekiel verse 16. Ezekiel chapter 16, please. Ezekiel chapter 16. Ezekiel 16, verse 49. Ezekiel 16, 49. Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom, and her daughter had arrogance, abundant food, and careless ease, but she did not, what's it say? Help the poor and needy. Thus they were haughty and committed abominations before me. Therefore I removed them when I saw it. Isn't that interesting? That so often when we think of Sodom and Gomorrah, the first thing we want to think about is sexual immorality. And here what do we see God saying? Here we see God saying the problem here was going on in this community was that they had been blessed, but yet they were not serving with their blessing. They were becoming haughty and arrogant with their blessing. Amen. We need to see this. So now comes the very interesting part. As God shows him the sin of what's going on. Verse 22, Then the men turned away from there and went towards Sodom, while Abram was still standing before the Lord. And Abram came near and said to them, Will thou indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are fifty righteous within the city. Will thou indeed sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the fifty righteous who are in it? Would you write in there on your margin somewhere that here Abraham, he approaches God, he appeals to him for Sodom on the basis of God's justice. I think that is how we are to approach God. We are to approach God on the basis of God's justice. Lord, because I know you are righteous and because I know you are true, I know you're not, not going to turn a blind eye to sin, but at the same time, I also know that you are willing to bring those who will repent. If we will confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. I can come boldly before the Lord based on his justice, based on his mercy, and based on his grace. His justice says, I'll get what I deserve. His mercy says, I won't get what I deserve. And His grace says, I get more than I deserve. And that's when she, excuse me, He comes and says, how about for 50 people? 
And this is what the Lord said. So, verse 26, If I find 50 righteous people within the city, then I will spare the whole place with their account. What is that important for you to know? Because there are folks who are going to talk about the, the Christians being involved in the punishment at the same time. All I'm seeing here is the Lord saying, listen, I'm not going to punish the righteous and the wicked together. Punish. Tribulations, yes, we all suffer. In this world, we have tribulations. But when it comes time for wrath and the punishment of God, He says, I'm not going to punish the righteous and the wicked together. And so He says, no, I won't do that. If there's 50 people, I won't be in there. Now verse 27 begins the fun part. And we're soon to finish. I am aware of the watch, and I know we got started a little bit later tonight. But... This comes the fun part. Because if you know the Lord's people, the Israelis, one of the things that they are very well known for is what? Bargaining. Bargaining. <laughs> Bartering. This is where I believe the birth of the Hebrew nation happened. <laughs> this is where the skill of the skills of the Semitic people comes in through Abraham and becomes a part of the people. It says here, he says, well, there are 50 people. He says, no, I won't do it for 50 people. Verse 27, And Abraham answered and said, Now behold, I venture to speak to the Lord, although I am but dust and ashes. Suppose 50 righteous are lacking five. Will thou destroy the whole city because of five? And he said, I will not destroy it if I find 45 there. And he spoke to him yet again and said, Suppose uh, 40 are found there. And he said, I will not do it on account of 40. And then he said, Oh, may the Lord not be angry. Uh, shall I speak? Suppose 30 are found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find 30 there. And he said, now, behold, I, I have ventured to speak to the Lord and suppose 20 are found there. And he said to him, I will not destroy it even on account of 20. Verse 32. You, you, and in other words, it's like, how low will you go here? You know what I mean? We started at 50. We're now at 20 here. Can I get 25, 25? Can I get 50? You know, he's going on down. Can I get 50? 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 Okay. So he's going all the way down here. And so, but I love it. He's always starting off with the humility. You know, um, you know I, I'm, 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 I am but dust here. Um, you know, just speaking it through. He's coming in the spirit of humility. And then verse 32. Oh, that the Lord may not be angry. Shall I speak this once? Suppose 10 are found there. And he said, I will not destroy it on account of the ten. And as soon as he had finished speaking to Abraham, the Lord departed and Abraham returned to his place. Folks, I need you to jot down that Abraham was not trying to convince God or talk him into something that God was against God's will. We do that. But that's not what was going on here. He was not trying to convince God that, no, even though you said not to date a non-believer, it's really going to work and it's really going to be good. Trust me, God. Lord, I know you've said this is not the way to do things and, da, 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 and I should claim everything on my taxes, but you know what? Trust me, God, this one's really going to work. This is okay. I know you said that I'm supposed to be reconciling with my family. I know I'm supposed to humble myself, but listen, I know they need to sweat it out a little bit, Lord, and so I'll wait on doing what you told me to do because we got to... No, 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 no. That's not what's going on here. What is he doing? As I said, he's saying, God, you are so just, you are so gracious, and you are so mighty. Lord God, if there's 50 there, but Lord, I know if you... 45. I know even 40, e even 30. In other words, he was going all the way down because why? Who does he know that's in that city? And Lot, wife, daughters. No, there's two daughters that come out with him, but then there's two daughters that are married. So we've got a family of eight that's in this community. He goes all the way down to 10 and stops right there and says, how about Lot's family and at least two more? And the irony is, church, there wasn't even the ten. And in fact, Lot's own family, he lost two of his girls, as we'll see. And only Lot, his wife, and his two daughters came out. You see, God is just, but God is holy. Amen. Father God, tonight, we need to hear from you that you are just, that you are holy. And Father, that we don't barter with you. There is no bargaining. The position of God is not up for re-election. Lord, we need to be the people of God tonight that just simply come and say, first and foremost, Lord God, thank you. You are worthy. You are mighty. You are holy. Lord, that we would be your people who would recognize you because we have sought to seek your face. We have come to be in the Spirit. And Lord, in the heat of the day, in the cool of the night, Lord, wherever it is, we are in a position where we are looking, that we would seek your face, that we would look unto you, Lord. All the scriptures that say these things for us, to seek and you will find. Lord, may we be those people who are looking in your direction, hearing your very words speaking to us, the revelations that you're given, that we would recognize the things of God. Lord, I pray that we would be those people who recognize that when we come before you and we worship you, Lord, the only thing you ask us to do is come with clean hands and a pure heart. 
And Father, we know that tonight that comes by the forgiveness that you give us on the cross. That, Lord, that we can also stand and have fellowship with you because of the tree, because of the cross, because you paid that price for us tonight. Lord, I pray that you would remove, again, a spirit of condemnation. I didn't mean to do that, Lord, and if I did, Lord, I ask for forgiveness. But, Lord, I do want us to be people who are going to be particular with our words, our words to others, our words to your people, our, our words to your bride, and our words unto you. The Lord Jesus, that we would be people of yes and people of no, faithful and full of faith. Stir us up, O oh God, that we would be those who would laugh in the laughter of, Lord, you are just so incredible but with you nothing is impossible. So increase our faith. Increase our passion tonight. Increase our ability, Lord God, to fellowship with you. And Lord, I do pray that at the end of this evening that we would not just be as Abraham, so blessed with the things that you've done for us, but Lord, we would also then turn and have compassion for those whom judgment is coming. And Lord, that's the second part of this message for me. I do not want to be the church that's what you're doing in my life and what you're doing in our church and in our ministry. But God, give us the eyes to see, oh, but Lord, could you just give us 50? Lord, how about if we just could get 40? Lord, if we could just get 10? Lord, if we could just reach 10 people before you come home, Lord, would you give us that privilege, that opportunity, Lord Jesus, to share with others that they would not have to go through the consequences of their sin and receive the forgiveness that, oh, Lord, please give us the hearts that would cry out based on your justice, Lord. We would know that there is consequence in sin, but Lord, based on your character of your mercy and grace, we know that there's forgiveness at the cross. Help us, Lord Jesus, as we worship you tonight. And if you're a person here tonight who needs to make that decision, you need to step out of darkness into light. You need to say that you recognize that there is consequences. And God has been speaking to you tonight is the time. Don't make other excuses. If you have heard the Lord say tonight, would you come home and be my child? All I'm going to ask you to do is look at me and raise your hand. We're going to worship in a moment. But all you need to do is look at me and just raise your hand and say, you know what? I want to have someone pray with me tonight to know what it means to become born again and surrender my life to Jesus. Right there. Amen. Praise God. Anyone else that needs to do that? Anyone else? Right out there in the back. Right on, bro. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Anybody else? Anybody else need to do it? Right there too? Amen. Praise God. We've got a third. Amen. Amen. Lord, these whose hands have gone up tonight, Lord, are just saying, Lord, there's a lot that we don't understand, but what we do understand, we want to be honest with, Lord. And so, Lord Jesus, I thank you for these brothers to tonight who have just said, Lord, here am I. Lord, you know them. You know their stories. You formed them in their mother's room. Lord, there is nothing that is impossible for you to do in their life. They can be saved because you said so. Lord, you died on a cross and rose again. And so, Lord, tonight, we ask that we would be the people who would come around being one another, growing in the grace and your mercy. Lord, all of us tonight just want to say thank you for dying on the cross for our sin. Thank you for being our Savior and Lord. Thank you for giving us your love that never ceases. Let's worship.